Are you interested in the anatomy of the sinus of Morgagni? Yeah? Which one? There are at least two and potentially four. Confusing, I know, we'll talk about this. Uh, what we'll do is we'll look at all the things that could potentially be the sinuses of Morgagni, look at the anatomy in each and clarify all of this as best we can, all right? So Morgagni was a major anatomist working from around 1700 onwards, I think he, 1682, 1771, birth date, death date. Um, he was a kind of a student of and worked for uh, Valsalva, but he was one of those guys working at one of those big early Italian universities, laying down a lot of modern anatomy, which means there are lots of structures that take on his name. And nowadays we're trying to use contemporary terms because when there are many structures named after somebody, confusion follows. And anatomy is about being clear and accurate. It's, that's what the language is for, right? I recently did a video on Herb's Point. Again, it turns out there are, more, there, there are multiple Herb's Points. And you guys in the comments pointed out also Morgagni's sinus. Right, there are at least, you talk to different people, they're aware of different Morgagni sinuses, but there are two in the head and neck. Let's do the most difficult one first. This is big head, and if I turn big head around, um, this is the posterior wall of the pharynx. It's made up of three pharyngeal constrictor muscles. Um, by the pharynx, I mean that this tube that's made in here, this is um, posterior to the nasal cavity, posterior to the oral cavity, and posterior to the larynx. We have the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx, right? So if you're going to make a tube, muscle's a good building block. Uh, and we have these, these uh, muscles here which wrap around like that, making the lateral parts and posterior parts of the pharynx. So there are three pharyngeal constrictor muscles and you need to have gaps between these pharyngeal constrictor muscles so things can get in and out of the pharynx. And the gap between the superior pharyngeal constrictor muscle and the bone of the base of the skull, um, essentially the gap is the sinus of Morgagni. Now, what we've really got in there is you've got um, fascia. So there's a fascia is a tough connective tissue sheet, right? And there's a layer of fascia deep to the muscle the pharyngo-basilar fascia, pharyngo-pharynx, basilar base of the skull. The pharyngo-basilar fascia is reinforcing all of that and, you know, reinforcing the walls of the pharynx. And there's a weakness there where that fascia runs from this superior constrictor muscle up to the base of the skull. So that really, that weakness in the pharyngo-basilar fascia is the sinus of Morgagni. And there are things that pass through the, that sinus of Morgan needs to get in and out of the pharynx. The most notable one for me is the, the pharyngotympanic tube or the eustachian tube or the auditory tube. Let me get another one of these. Right. Um, this is what I'm talking about here. This is that superior pharyngeal constrictor muscle curving around like that to make the posterior and lateral walls of the pharynx. Um, there's the skull there, uh, so it's wrapping around like that. Now, the opening here, that is the opening of the pharyngotympanic tube, or the auditory tube, or the eustachian tube. Uh, that is leading up to the middle ear, right? That's leading up to the tympanic membrane. That's where you equalize the pressure in your ear through here. So that auditory tube, the ear is here, so that auditory tube is passing through that pharyngo basilar weakness, that sinus of Morgagni, to open here. Um, this is the hard palate. Look, these are the teeth here. At the posterior end of the hard palate, we have the soft palate. The soft palate is made up of a number of muscles. And back here, we have tensor veli palatini and levator veli palatini. And levator veli palatini, at least, is also passing through the sinus of Morgagni to anchor itself up here. Um, 
and that lifts up the soft palate. There are also a couple of blood vessels, a couple of uh, pharyngeal branches of bits and bobs that pass through here to supply blood, blood, blood to bits and bobs. So that's what we're talking about. That's what the sinus of Morgagni is. The reason this anatomy is important clinically is because um, pharyngeal tumours or nasopharyngeal tumours around here, well, they're going to be restricted as to where they can expand into by these nice thick muscles here, right? But the sinus of Morgani up here, this weakness, this gap between the superior pharyngeal constrictor and the base of the skull, this weakness in the pharyngeal, pharyngobasilar uh, fascia would allow a tumour to expand laterally. Um, and we said the eustachian tube is here, so there could be an effect on hearing. Um, also, I said that this muscle of the palate is passing through here, so it could have an effect on palate function. And out here we've got the oval foramen. So very nearby we've got the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. It could start compressing into that sort of space. That's the sort, you know, this is, this is the reason this anatomy is important, is, uh, is in that case, right? Uh, question, what is the contemporary name for this sinus of Morgagni? Because I can't find one. I don't know what it is. I asked my ENT colleagues, they haven't got one either. I've, I've looked it up. Um, I don't think it's referenced in uh, Terminolo Terminologia Anatomica. Anyway, that's the first sinus of Morgagni. The gap between the base of the skull and the superior pharyngeal constrictor muscle. Okay, so where's the next one? This one is much easier to describe. We are in the larynx down here and we have the true vocal cords and the false vocal cords. Okay, larynx is complicated, but other than that, it's, I can actually point at it. Now, if I get a bigger model of the larynx and I open this up, there we go. So there's the true vocal cords. This is the bit that's vibrating while I'm talking to make sound. Uh, here we have a membrane. At the bottom edge of that membrane, we have another, uh, we have a mucosal fold. This gets called the false vocal cords. And in between the two, there is a sinus. That's right. That is also a sinus of Morgagni. Uh, the, uh, this is this contemporary, the contemporary name for this is the, is the ventricle. Like, so when you chat to ENT surgeons about this, they just say, that's the ventricle, because they know that we're in the larynx. I guess you could call it the laryngeal ventricle. But that fold of membrane in there is the ventricle, but its old name is the sinus of Morgagni. So that's two sinuses of Morgagni. Big heart model, <laughs> big expensive heart model, so we be careful not to drop this one. Whoop. Uh, there's the pulmonary trunk, there's the aorta, right? So the aorta is coming out of the left ventricle. If I pop this off, way, so I'm taking off the aorta and we look down. So the red one there, that's the, um, the aorta. We can see the, the semilunar valves there uh, controlling the flow out of the left ventricle and into the aorta and stopping it going back. These, um, these semilunar valves, these, these semilunar cusps, or these cusps of the semilunar valves, they're shaped like half moons. Um, and you can see the coronary arteries are coming off them. Um, and the, the, the aorta here is a little bit swollen at each of these cusps. These are the aortic sinuses, also known as the sinuses of Valsalva. And I said that Morgani was a student of um, he was a student of Valsalva, but Valsalva was also his boss when he started working. Um, so these guys worked together, they were closely related. Now supposedly, either these sinuses are also known as the sinuses of Morgagni, or one of those sinuses is known as the sinus of Morgagni. I have struggled to find any solid information or evidence backing up any of this. But these are definitely known as the sinuses of Valsalva. And Morgani was definitely associated with Valsalva, so it's not beyond the, you know, beyond the reach of imagination, but one of these sinuses, or all of them, is also a sinus of Morgani. It does get referenced, it pops up. The reason I mention it is it pops up, the aortic sinus of Morgani. Confusing, 
that's what it's referring to. Now, in modern terms, um, they've got a couple of names, but that sinus would be the left coronary sinus because the left coronary artery is coming from it. That sinus would be the right coronary sinus because we've got the right coronary artery coming from it. And that sinus hasn't got any coronary arteries coming from it, so we call it the non-coronary sinus. There are other ways of referring to them as well, but those are one of my preferred ways of naming them if we have the normal anatomy. So that's three sinuses of Morgagni. One more, we've got to go to the other end. Okay, in the last part of the gastrointestinal tract, here's the rectum, the straight bit, here's the anal canal, and you can just about see in here that there are some anal columns. These columns are formed because, well, it's the shape of the mucosa, we've got some blood vessels running longitudinally underneath this. But these columns are also known as the columns of Morgagni. And that's fine. But the, at the inferior end of the columns, there is a sinus. And from that sinus, there are glands here that secrete a mucus that lubricate the passage of feces through the anal canal. Could you imagine how these sinuses could be mistakenly referred to as the sinuses of Morgagni? And these are the sorts of things you might hear. So the, these are the problems with using these old eponymous terms in our human memory, which is fallible, is that we remember a thing, we remember it incorrectly, and we pass on that incorrect memory, and we say, yes, the columns of Morgagni and the sinuses of Morgagni. <laughs> so whichever sinus of Morgagni you wanted to know more about, whether it was the sinus of Morgagni between the superior pharyngeal constrictor and the base of the skull, or if it was the, pharyng the sinus of Morgagni in the larynx, or the sinus of Morgagni um, at the start of the aorta, or the sinus of Morgagni in the anal canal, I hope I've covered the anatomy satisfactorily for you. Um, Morgagni was one of those really, really important anatomists, and there are many, many other structures that have taken his name. And of course, this is the way many things have been named throughout the body. But it, it's another example of how this can be confusing, and some people are aware of these terms and some people are not, and they get passed on and confused a little bit, as we saw with Herb's point. Um, when we teach, we try to teach the eponymous name that is, be, that is being used clinically because you need to understand that term. And we teach the modern term, the contemporary term, um, the term that hopefully reduces confusion and makes the language of anatomy more accurate. Anyway, okay. Hopefully that was interesting at least. See you next week.